Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Well, we've managed to keep abreast of the news. We're doing a special supplement this week, an extra two episodes, possibly, dealing with the racism in the royal family, which I think you've correctly identified as a as a real problem for them. Uh, I feel been... like, um, you know, Al-, Al Pacino in the Godfather films? I'm trying to get out. They keep pulling me back in. These royals. <laughs> yes. We keep I wanting to do stories. Them. Yeah, well, I mean, I think we've got two interesting perspectives. We've got uh, Lady Colin Campbell, who's known for her very critical views of Meghan. And then we've got Clive Irving from the Daily Beast X Sunday Times, who is going to give us an American perspective, which I suspect will be slightly different. Yes, well, Clive is is, is quite a lot uh, warmer towards Harry and Meghan, and also he's been quite a big critic of the royal family in, in its behaviour towards, well, the legacy of slavery, for example, and other things. Yeah. So yeah. He's a, he, you might say, put it crudely, he's a, a kind of voice from the left, the liberal left. Uh, whereas yeah. I think Lady Colin Campbell is going to probably give Meghan and Harry both barrels. Well, she's always good value. Um, and, you know, clearly is well connected. So I'm looking forward to it. I think this is the first time we've we put on two episodes on consecutive nights. Yes, um, fingers crossed. We haven't quite got our head around the technical details. We're hoping to put this programme out on Monday, if it's Monday now, and uh, tomorrow the one with Clive. Um, but I do think it's a big story. And I, and I think it's a, it's a crisis for the royal family, actually. I think... These allegations are very pernicious, and for a long time, the Queen and the Royals were seen to be above politics. But can they be above identity politics? Yes, which is well, look, a very powerful force in our world. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, you know, and Air Wilson uh, in the today's Mail uh, on the Saturday's Mail rather talks about um, this being a critical point for them. They need to address it. I mean, I think the irony is that the, the King has has done more than most public figures to try and bridge the gap between different communities. Well, he probably has. not People often talk about the Prince's Trust being quite revolutionary in its time, the work he did in disadvantaged communities. But, um, yeah, this uh, it's already been picked up on social media, as everything is, of course. Um, and Kate, you know, Kate's the great hope, isn't she? She's the future queen. And to have a, a big question mark over her in this way, that she perhaps carries around sort of ancient prejudices, it's not good at all, whether it's Most true steps. or not. Well, I'm I'm just in, 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 intrigued as a publisher on the whole leak of this of this uh, book in Holland. Holland, of course, as you know, is the smallest market in publishing. So if you're going to pulp any books, that's the best place to pulp them. So it makes me think rather cynically that this has been a, a deliberate exercise. But we've both written books that have been translated. You rather more than me, but we've both done it. And yeah. you know, you have to send the text ahead of time. So, you know, it takes a long time to translate a book. So I think it's quite possible they sent an early draft and then later on they had second thoughts about naming Charles and Kate. But for some reason that was never communicated to Holland. Yes, well, I mean, possibly. I mean, it'd be interesting to see the legal action. Who takes the rap? Is it the Dutch publisher or is it the uh, the original publisher? Uh, so this story still has some way to run. But it'll be interesting to see how the royal family react, the stories that they may actually even take legal action. Yeah. Um, it's a funny thing, though. There's the, the something kind of... I haven't read the book yet, Scobie's book, but there's been such a lot of coverage. It seems to be very much targeted at Kate. Yeah. You know, belittling her, mocking her. Um, you know, you have to think this is the view, whether Meghan or Harry briefed him or not. This is the view from Monticello. This is what they think of her. And you think, God, the, the, the poison in that relationship must be... Very, very, very deep now. Yeah, well, she is the obvious in some ways rival to, to Megan. So I mean, if you're going to take anyone down, that's the one to take down. I mean, the irony is in some ways she is the person who has most transformed the fortunes of the royal family over the last few years. Um, so it's... Uh, I, I just think about the timeline of all this. I mean, if you remember the details, Megan has never said that she heard any conversation about the colour of her child. She said that Harry heard a conversation before they were married on this subject. Yeah. yeah. And it's clear now that, you know, whether Charles was involved, Kate was apparently involved. And I can imagine in my head, do you remember, they were great friends. That was the story. Harry was always saying, Kate's like the sister I never had. And they would hang out and they would have a few drinks in the evening. And, you know, can you imagine he's got a new girlfriend? 
and he's excited about it. And they say, oh, God, Harry, she's gorgeous. You know, maybe one day you'll have kids and, oh, God, I hope they look more handsome than you, you ginger I mean, you go, you can imagine Yeah, exactly. Do I have on the back and they frizzy have ginger laugh. hair? They all have yeah, no, I agree. Maybe Kate says something like, I don't know, yeah, wouldn't it be wonderful to have some... A bit of ex, you know something more colourful in the family than all these boring white people. Let's maybe that she said that maybe, yeah. and they all yeah. had a good laugh about it. Fast forward, two, two or three years later, everybody's fallen out over whatever big or small things. They're all very very kind of angry about each other. And Harry says to Meghan, "Do you know what? They once even speculated about the baby. You know they did." And then Meghan says, "What? They were concerned about it." And Harry says, "Oh, oh yeah, yeah, something like that." And then that word, the C word, is the killer word that she uses at Oprah. Because yeah. it's, it's one thing to speculate, but it's another thing to be concerned. Yeah. Well, it's 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 like a divorce, I suppose. You know, things are weaponized that have come from the past. But, I mean, the papers today are saying um, that th- there needs to be some sort of reconciliation for the long-term future of the monarchy. But I, I can't see in these circumstances how anyone can come together. Um well, you're, you're actually, you're very right to mention divorce because we've talked about this before with Diana. You know, details of her marriage with Charles and incidents like the famous staircase that we spoke about nearly a year ago when we did the Diana episode. You know, a, a little stumble on a staircase years later becomes a fully fledged suicide attempt when she's rolling on the floor in front of the Queen. And, you know, yeah. things get exaggerated well, and twisted. I mean, you know, we've been talking a lot about what's happened in the past, but actually, of course, it has a great deal of relevance to what's happening now. The the, the problems of the past and, the, and their childhood are, are coming back to to, to, to to sow discord, really. Um, think, William's it's, sort of got over it. There's a national, an international element to this. It's not just falling out between, you know, rather ridiculous figures in the royal family. It's This is about Britain's image, about trade deals, about diplomacy. Um, I, I imagine the cabinet will have talked about it already because it's uh, it, it needs sorting. Yes, well, also we're on the verge of a Labour government, and it'll be interesting to see if if there will be an, 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 a financial crisis. Will will people be looking at the monarchy in, in fresh with fresh eyes uh, and the cost of the monarchy, cost of security, uh, uh, and the number of houses and the role they play? Uh, so I think there's some big questions. <laughs> and all that. I mean, and hopefully maybe Clive will be looking at that. when we Yes, talk we to must him. ask Clive about that because uh, that's very much his thing. He's very well plugged in, I think, with people who probably end up being in the government in a year's time. Yeah. No, so much to talk about. And I think this is a genuinely big story. Yeah, great. And how are things looking with, with looking back for previous podcasts? Are we getting good reviews? Are we We had getting... a very nice new review, actually. Um, I, 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 I managed to lose on Apple. But we also had some good ones on... YouTube, which is sitting here somewhere. Um, yes, people really enjoyed um, Gerard last week. Gerald talking about um, Kennedy hasn't got the biggest figures we've ever had, but some you know people really liked it. Excellent interview, Kaza Swan, Peter Chris, outstanding interview. He says Mary Alford says I definitely think there's something more to this. Fair enough. Geraldine McGowan, I think she's commented before. Man oh man, what a great episode! So you know, oh, good. We're doing something well, right. We- yeah, well, I mean, we hope Gerald might come back. I mean, we've got a number of other episodes which we, we've lined up to take us through into the new year, which are non-royal. I mean, the Madeleine yes. McCann story. We've, we've uh, done Madeleine McCann interview. We've, we've talked to somebody really, really interesting conversation about Jimmy Savile. All this stuff is coming up. If the royals will ever let us leave them. <laughs> yes. Well, we want you to f- tell us what you want. I mean, the royals seem to be what you want. So those are the ones, the largest listening figures. But we like to look at other subjects. Uh, and, and talk to a range of people and, re- and have a range of views. Yes, we so do. we're always keen to hear what, what you would like. I mean, we've put the Madeleine McCann on because of a request. And I think we're looking at Robert Maxwell and, and the Jeremy Thorpe story, which I think someone yes. requested. There's great scandals from the 70s and 80s uh, that tell you a lot about British life and how, how mad it was in that time. You know, and I'd like to look at Lockerbie, which again, there's a, there's a big debate about about that and, 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 and you know, who actually was responsible. So, I mean, we've both got lots of ideas of things that we want to cover. And more importantly, let's get cut to the chase. We yeah, I'm mugs. sorry. I haven't got my mug. It's a dishwasher. It was being ah. so popular. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, there so, you are. Your perfect Christmas gift. There's a special scandalous someone in your life. If Etsy. you're feeling scandalous. Links in I the bio. The t-shirts as well, if people are, are, are brave enough. Lamborghinis, you know, yachts, all branded. Maybe so it's... 
Good. So should Good. we go to Lady Colin? Yes, let's um, let's brace ourselves for a blast of, of of the wisdom from the upper reaches of the aristocracy. Here we go. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And we wanted to ask you about um, this leak of, of the two names in this racist row. Um, I mean, do you think this is a publicity stunt or is it just a mistake that the wrong copy was sent to be translated before it had been legaled? Come on, Andrew, you are a writer. I'm a writer. We know it's not possible for a mistake like this to happen. It's If it's a mistake, it wouldn't have happened. The whole thing has been deliberately done so that Megan and Amit Scabies will get out there the names that she has had as a bugbear for some time. Charles is incidental in all of this. Her real target is Catherine. And did but, you know about the names beforehand? Yes, I also know that Pr Princess Anne was also a name that was being bandied about. Right. Gosh, that's a story. That hasn't come out. You know, remember, it was supposed to be, according to Harry, one allusion to the colour of the skin of the baby before the marriage, which incidentally is perfectly natural. People always speak about, you know, is the child going to be fair-haired? Is it going to be dark-haired? Is it going to be looking like mummy or daddy or granny or grandpa? I mean, these are perfectly normal things that Harry has scurried back to Meghan to make himself out to be a hero. And Meghan, in her racist way, has weaponized. Uh, and she has used all of this to make herself come across as somebody who is being attacked when she's not being attacked. And it's it's a ploy. The whole thing is a ploy. And my understanding is that had there been any concerns, as to use the word she has used, they would have actually preferred that the children be darker rather than fair skin. And let's remember, Prince Charles has many cousins who have black blood. The head of the Mountbatten family, George Milford Haven, is a descendant of a black slave from, from Chad called Hannibal. The Duke of Westminster is a descendant of the same slave. Uh, Prince Philip was mooted as a husband for Gina Verner, his cousin, who again was another descendant of the same black slave. It's not as if to say that black blood is uh, such a rarity in those circles. You know, I mean, I just mentioned three top names in this country who were descended from African slaves. Be well, because I thought they were all meant to be trying to be friends again. This seems to have just made things a lot worse. Or, or was this never really the case, that Meghan didn't want to put out a peace offering? Of course it was rubbish. I mean, I just said it all along. You know, I knew that, this, that the supposed olive branch that they were offering was a poisoned chalice. You know, olive branch, my foot. It was a branch of a laburnum tree, <laughs> you know, laden Gosh. with poisoned seeds. It was quite obvious to me that this was a ploy on their part to pretend that they, and also to get themselves colomichis, by the way, because they're obsessed with getting colomichis. That they they knew what was coming in the scabies book, and so they thought, All right, we are going to obfuscate and divert. But I think their tactics are now so transparent that I think people are on to what's going on. I don't think people are deceived anymore. Well, I, just to interrupt a second, I mean, I think like you, I. 
I can imagine a friendly conversation before the marriage that's been reinterpreted and exaggerated and weaponized, as you say. I totally can understand that. But I also think if you read what people around the world are saying, and also some black British commentators as well, it, it, it is a problem for the royal family that they have to handle going forward, that this has been raised. Um, and they have enough tr issues, don't they, in the Commonwealth? The, a lot of the tours recently have run into trouble on the issues of race relations and the history of slavery. Um, how do you think they should handle I that? Agree with you. I agree with you that this is very mischievous on the part of Harry and Meghan. You know, they and they are fully aware of the fact that the last time they raised this subject, that it had a disastrous effect upon the tour of that William and Catherine undertook in, say, Belize and Jamaica. Now, I'm Jamaican. I know very intimately what happened in Jamaica. And the whole thing was totally uncalled for. And you, what Harry and Meghan have done is they have catered to the racists in these countries to the detriment of moderates who really would prefer to have their history incorporated as a part of the reality instead of having all of this divisiveness. So it's both damaging, yet in some ways it's going to, uh, it's damaging for everyone really, because Scobie doesn't come out of this world, nor does do do the Sussexes. Well, I mean, Scobie comes out of it as the total rat that he is, in my opinion, because you know, uh, Saskia Peters, the translator, has made it absolutely clear, as you and I, Andrew, would know, we have books that are translated all the time into foreign languages. And there's absolutely no doubt that the author has to sign off on everything. And until the author signs off on everything, the book is not handed over for translation. So Amid Scabie's story simply just doesn't make sense at all to anybody who knows the process of publishing. I think he's simply come up with a stupid lie, but he and Meghan and Harry come up with one stupid lie after the other in the hope that dupes will believe them. And maybe dupes do, but anybody who thinks and understands the reality knows that these are deeply destructive, malicious, nasty people. I mean, when you stop to think of it, they have endangered the livelihood of a very well-respected translator. And they have also caused the publisher to pump, pulp, to pump, uh, pulp, sorry, pulp, 5,000 copies of a book that he will have paid to publish. I mean, the whole thing stinks to high heaven. Well, I mean, surely he'll only pay if he's made a mistake. Uh, if, if, you know, the only version he had had the names, he's not at fault. But I think what Phil and I suspect is that they're just translating from a pre-legal copy. Uh, and it was a cock-up. They just didn't get the right copy. Well, if they didn't get the right copy, you and I will both know the reason why they didn't get the right copy was that the author and the publisher of Origin chose to send them the wrong copy. That's not a mistake that you can make unless you do it deliberately. And what's the purpose of this? I mean, is it just to get column inches, as you say, to get back at Catherine? Or do they have a bigger agenda about the monarchy? I think it's to get themselves publicity. I think it's for Amid Scabies to get himself publicity to sell the book. I think it's Megan to get the names out so that when she comes up with her own version of her truth, which is a three-letter word beginning with L and ending in E, the middle letter being I, that she, you see, for she and Harry had both said they would never reveal the names. Well, they said they'd never reveal the name. They never said it was two people. They said it was one person. It's now become convenient for them to have fabricated not one, but two people. And possibly and three. 
and there is a third in the offing being Princess Anne. So all of a sudden, it's gone from one to three, and it's gone. The conversation has gone from before they were married to when she was magnant with Archie, she having an artificial situation. And, you know, think about it. None of it makes sense except for people who are just grabbing at straws and throwing them into the poultice in the hope that it will make a break. And when you say artificial situation, what, what do you mean by that? I think the whole thing is an artificial construct. Right, okay. I think the whole thing is an artificial construct from beginning to end. I think that Meghan has used her little bit of black blood to weaponize and to create havoc. And I think that she has quite deliberately and calculatedly set out to create a scenario where she would be victimized. And since she has not been able to come up with genuine victimhood, she has fabricated incidents of ostensible victimhood. She has, for according to her version of things, her latest version of things. There were concerns over how dark Archie's skin color would be. Well, since nobody was going to say to her or oh, Harry, we're really concerned about how dark the baby's skin is going to be, there might have been conversations. We wonder if the baby's going to look like Doria or Megan or Harry or Diana or which these are perfectly normal conversations that people have, whether they are in a uniracial relationship with a uniracial baby or a biracial or a triracial situation. So what what do the royal family do? How do they respond to this? And I mean, do you feel this is the end of any sort of rapprochement that might have taken place? I mean, you know, they are now going to be permanently exiled. And possibly well, I, use their titles. I don't think there was any prospect of a rapprochement before. I thought that was all diversionary, and this, and I think that there is no prospect whatsoever. My understanding is that William and Catherine, from before this, have got Harry's measure and Meghan's measure, and that they don't want to know and will never want to know. His father, being a parent, it's a slightly different situation, and his father has hoped that he could somehow establish some sort of, if not working relationship, certainly a relationship free of hostility. But I understand that it's obvious you only need to put yourself into the king's shoes to know that if you were in that situation you would know the whole exercise is pointless but other people have been telling him for some time it is pointless as long as harry is with megan and as long as harry is self-medicating by his own account there is no possibility of rationality and good reason prevailing. I mean, the, so way this, the way this could end is for Harry to put out a statement, because all of these things were only ever said to Harry. Nobody's ever alleged that anything was ever said to Meghan. So Harry needs to put out a statement, or he could, saying, misunderstanding, things have got out of hand, nobody ever said anything hurtful, take the temperature down, let's be friends. I mean, that sounds like Pollyanna land. But that would at least, that would end it, wouldn't it? Well, yes, it would, except, of course, he tried a version of that with Tom Bradby, didn't he? He said that, uh, you know, that Meghan had never said, made racist allegations against the royal family. And remember, he gave this interview a few weeks after they had accepted an award from Kerry Kennedy for fighting institutional racism within the royal family. 
So, I mean, clearly somebody doesn't have a very good memory, and it's certainly not you or me, it's Harry. Because if you accept a reward for fighting racism within the royal family, you don't a few weeks later spin around and say, no, the press are the ones who made this up. Well, Meghan is very clearly in the Oprah interview stating there were concerns and conversations about how dark Archie's skin was going to be. Notwithstanding the fact that Harry, in the same interview, placed that conversation with him and not with Meghan before the marriage. Mm. Is she now trying to say that she was magnant with Archie before the marriage? I mean, the whole thing is artificial to the nth degree. Does Harry still under her thumb? Uh, or, I mean, there have been stories that the two of them have, have been living separately, for example. Yes, well, the marriage was under some strain. But, you know, I know from my own parents' marriage, which, you know, my mother was a narcissist, and I wrote a book on it called Daughter of Narcissus. That when you're dealing with a narcissistic relationship, the other partner is reeled out and reeled back in as and when it is convenient. So, you know, the fa and, and re relationships like that are extremely turbulent, but they can last. A lifetime. My parents' marriage lasted for the duration of my father's life. So I never held out any hope that the relationship is necessarily going to end. But it certainly is turbulent and it will remain turbulent. And Megan is the driving force in that relationship. Maybe one of these days, Harry will have enough gumption and enough backbone to leave. But maybe he'll be like my father, say it's for the children, and then long after the children have departed, he doesn't leave, you know, because men like that usually adore their mothers, and they usually marry women who they, on some level, they have locked into the fact that they've got another mummy. Right. Well, Duke of Windsor. Um... Well, again, they are very Oedipal. The whole thing is very Oedipal. It's but this isn't going to play well for the for the for Sussexes. I mean, they're they're running out of road, aren't they, in terms of making money and selling stories? I couldn't agree more. I think they have run out of road. I think you're seeing the death knell. I think the death knell might be very protracted, but I think that what you're seeing is the death knell. I think this can go on for years, God forbid. And I mean, if the royal family, I mean, what, what do you advise them to do? I mean, should they be, um, you know, sending their children to comprehensives in the middle of London? Should they be having all their staff recruited from the Caribbean? I mean, how can they respond to this? Well, first of all, let's remember the African and, and Caribbean percentage of the population in this country is tiny. It's, I think, I don't remember exactly how much it is. I think it's about three or four percent. Then you have the subcontinental, which is another and so say the whole thing goes up to 11 or 12 percent. Everybody else is either Caucasian or non-subcontinental and non-black or non-African heritage, let's put it that way. So if you're going just off the figures, you it's still a minority. Why should the minority dominate? I mean, just think uh, of that. Well, I think well, maybe one reason it's Andrew's raising it is there's a Commonwealth and there's international relationships. I think this 
is probably already being discussed in government because the royals represent the country. They're really important in diplomacy. They're really important in trade. You know, and if if whenever they're traveling now, there are people shouting out, "Are you a racist? Do you not like black people?" It's a significant problem, I would say. Oh, I think I think they need to they need to be aware of that, and I think they need to have more visibly black people around. But to say that the whole thing should be weighted in in favor of blacks is in itself racist. And, and also, I think they need to have people of quality. Now, for instance, they could have somebody like Trevor Phillips, who is, you know, a very sound and solid person. And if they had somebody like Trevor Phillips advising them, but there are other people that they have who do advise them. You know, one of the lieutenants of London is black. Oh. No, no, I, I do, I do know that. I, I, it's interesting that the Queen, of course, was famously enthusiastic for the Commonwealth, and nobody ever said a word against her in terms of prejudice. And of course, Kate is going to be Queen, and the contrast there. If I, if I was Kate or Kate's private secretary right now, I'd be thinking, how do I remove this problem, this sort of sword of Damocles that's now going to be hanging over me? Well, I don't think it needs to actually end up being a sword of Damocles. This is an accusation that has been uh, furthered by Meghan Markle, who is a notorious liar and extremely envious of Catherine. So I think we need to consider this source. And I think with the passage of time, more and more people will see that there is a malignant element to this that is entirely due to Meghan Markle. But Meghan Markle is the one who has created this situation. And Meghan Markle is the one who will ultimately suffer as a result of it, because she might be able to inflict suffering at the moment, but like most sadists. But ultimately, they, if they are not clever, and most of them aren't, they get caught up in their own vice. Let's remember, even the Marquis de Sade spent most of his life in a prison. You know, <laughs> and Meghan, Meghan is due for, Meghan is going to be exposed for the malignant, really rather vicious race baiting. But don't you think the people just. Personality that she is. But don't you think that there is a part of the of the population who are very happy to believe these stories? Um, uh, and that's the market she's playing to. Traditionally, it's always been stronger in the States. So I think the States is turning on her. So she'll always have some form of constituency that will listen to her. Well, everybody, you know, every crackpot has a constituency. You know, even Hitler still has a constituency. But is Hitler taken as a serious proposition or are Hitlerian ideas taken as a serious proposition? Or is, it, or is Nazism re regarded as a serious political force? Absolutely not. And every time Meghan does something like this, which is because let's be clear about it, you know, Amid Scabies got those names from Meghan. And That's how could he got those names from? I mean, has he got them directly from her? Well, he says not. And it doesn't matter whether they came directly from her or not. The fact is they came from her. How is he in a position to assert what a conversation that took place privately unless she revealed it? Did the king reveal it? Did Catherine reveal it? If they didn't reveal it, Meghan revealed it. Gosh. So if you were advising the palace, what, what, how would you tell them, show them to deal with this? Well, I don't want to give snap answers, uh, because if I were advising them, I would have to put on my thinking cap very seriously. And I would most likely do it in increments. But my objective would be to neutralize her by shining the light of fact upon her. You know, the way to deal with people like Meghan is to unmask them 
And you don't have to do it in one fell swoop. You can do it incrementally. And that my advice to them would be to unmask her. Now, I've been the victim of a Meghan Markle types in my life. And I have fought them and won. So I know what I'm talking about. Because presumably we're going to have more books, perhaps, that were written with the cooperation of the royal family. I mean, the only way to fight them is to leak stories to tame biographers, surely. I don't think that's necessarily so, Andrew, with due respect. I think that our... There are sufficient biographers out there, one of whom you're speaking to, who have sufficiently good contacts that the royals don't need to leak things and and manipulate the situation. The truth is there, and it washes up on various shores. And I think it's actually better that the royals don't leak value the press. I think that is actually an unworthy way of going about it. I can. I certainly think, though, that they should be. It, it's taking firm action. Uh, as I say, I don't want to come to have a snap judgment, because I think situations like this are so nuanced and and so layered that to really be effective, you need to give it a lot of thought. And you then need to do what needs to be done at the time. Sometimes it's a killer knockout blow, and other times it's just a banana skin. Uh, I mean, removing their titles, would that have any effect, or would that just earn them sympathy? It would only earn them sympathy amongst those who are already going to be sympathizing with them. I think it certainly would be a route to follow. I think that uh, it would do the family at the end of the day no harm whatsoever. I think they should not have done it in the early days, but the more that emerges and the more complicit it becomes apparent that Meghan and, to an extent, Harry have been in betraying the interests of their family, of this nation, and of this nation's political structure, is the more obvious it becomes that maybe a radical solution such as that should be implemented. A total breach. It's just a complete breach. You're private citizens now. You've got no royal titles. We want nothing to do with you. Because well, in effect, in effect, you know, uh, in effect, we, I think, I think that they, they could, they could make it clear, uh, or and do it in such a way that you, you have. You are private citizens, and they don't have to say that it's in response. I don't know. I don't want to actually answer the question, because as I say, in situations like this, one has to be so nuanced. I mean, I've learned in life, in really important situations like this, the devil is in the detail, and you need to to come up with a solution where you are absolutely in the right, and the other person is absolutely in the wrong you draw the line and you hold to it firmly because i mean the sussexes must be vulnerable financially i mean the costs of security their lifestyle and presumably they're appearing quite toxic to to commercial organizations now yes well i've been saying that for some time <laughs> you know i mean anybody who has anything to do with the business world or with the financial world will know that nobody wants to attach themselves to losers and certainly not to toxic losers. And what Harry and Meghan had to sell was their eminence, their royalty, their glamour, the gold dust that goes along with being royal. And they have they have stripped away all of that. And so they have only themselves to blame. And, you know, earlier on, you mentioned about the money. All, all these phantasmagorical figures that they have been banding around are rubbish. They've never made the class of money. 
that that they were saying that they made. You know, they might have signed a deal that after 20 years, if they had been fin financially fabulously successful, they could have ended up with $120 million. Well, after 20 years, figure that out. That's is that about six million dollars a year. So if you think about it, they they have overegged the pudding at every stage, and they don't have a class of money. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They don't have the class of money that they have tried to make out that they have. They just don't have it. So will and, they do something desperate now? Will there be a nuclear option, another book, for example? I mean, there must well, be other secrets that haven't Megan been... Megan hasn't written a book yet. She's the one person... Let, let, not let me break down the math to you. Harry and Megan's lifestyle requires a capital amount of five to seven hundred million dollars with them having an income of four to six million dollars. They don't have and never had and never will have five to seven hundred million dollars. They might have had an income of four to six million dollars. But that is an income with no backing from capital. You need to have capital to, if you're, if they want to live the billionaire lifestyle, well, if you are going to live the billionaire lifestyle, you better make sure you have, if not a billion, a half a billion. The way they live, even 200 million would be challenging for them. So they just, they are unrealistic, including financially unrealistic. So what's likely to happen to them over the next few years? Are they going to have to downsize? Are they going to have to move to Frogmore Cottage again? Well, they can't move to Frogmore Cottage. Yeah. William doesn't want them anywhere near him or his children. And he's quite right, and nor does Catherine. I mean, they were in walking distance to Adelaide Cottage. Uh, and after their unreliability and their unpredictability, and the fact that Megan herself had discomfited poor little Princess Charlotte, which is some, you know, parents may forgive an injury you do to them, but they never forgive an injury you do to their child. And I was approached by people from Givenchy who told me about what had happened that day in that fitting with Meghan and the Mulrooney child and Princess Charlotte. And Catherine had recently given birth and you know, you're not mean to a three-year-old child. I'm sorry, you're just not. And to play off a three-year-old child the way she did and triangulate her with the Mulrooney child was just unacceptable. And no, the, William and Catherine don't want Meghan and Harry anywhere near them. They're not going back to Frogmore Cottage, ever. Is my understanding, and, and never coming back to Britain, presumably they either. Were stripped of it, they were stripped of it because William and Catherine don't want them nearby. They are worried about the effect they would have on their family and their lives, and their and the proximity would be too unnerving and discomforting. It is so sad, though, isn't it? I mean, we're just watching the Crown. I'm sure you've, well, maybe you're not watching it this time, but. The scenes with the boys and the Diana's death and how they look to each other for comfort. And now here we are, all these years later, when, you know, one's banished the other and one's leaking stories about the other and exaggerating, no doubt, things that were said when they were friends. It is a very but, sad ending to that brotherhood. So the whole thing is tragic because, you know, Harry's ambition was always to meet a girl like 
Catherine, who he loved and who loved him. And, you know, she was a sister he'd never had. And they got along very well. And his vision, and he hints at this in the spare, by the way, was that they would be a very happy foursome. Well, what does he do? He tries with Chelsea Davy. He tries with Cressida Bonus, neither of whom wanted to run the course with him because he is such a trip and a half. And then he picks up this piece of garbage, quite frankly, who, uh, but as soon as William and Catherine saw her, they knew what they were dealing with. They, she, she was so transparently obvious that they knew from the word go what they were dealing with, and they turned out to be absolutely right. And was nothing done to try and dissuade him from from marrying her? Yes. You know, William was was criticised for for us telling him to sort of take his time. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's in my book, Andrew. You represented me on. The yeah. Book. No, no. I want more people to know what's well, in. He, he never book. reads his clients' books, obviously. <laughs> no, they're very good. And would you kind of watered down the book because at one point, I mean, because people yeah. felt. That I was I was informed that I had to I had to modify, but but in the book I make it absolutely clear that Harry was warned against marrying Meghan, and that the Queen and Prince Philip tried to talk him out of it, and that when Prince Philip tried to talk him out of it, he he erupted. And the Queen intervened, and the Queen tried to pour oil on troubled water along the lines of, oh, you know, your grandfather. And he, he told them that, and I need to use this version for legal reasons, he told them that they would be accused of racism if they did not allow the marriage to proceed. Well, was the Queen right to bow to that sort of pressure? Or should she have put her foot down then and there and said, sorry? So it sounds like Harry was a pretty tr tricky character even before he met Mag Meghan, and it just made the situation worse, that she brought out the worst characteristics of him. Yes, he always was a difficult person, and he always was a tricky number. But he had a positive side as well, and an endearing side. And that mattered greatly to people. And that allowed him to have a degree of popularity, both publicly and privately. But he always was a hothead. He always was irrational. He always was really quite paranoid. I mean, he used to be saying, oh, the paparazzi are after me. Look at them behind that tree. And his girlfriends would say, Harry, there's no tree there. There can't be paparazzi. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, they, they finally had enough of his nonsense. But with Megan, he found somebody who, oh, yes, oh, yes, Harry. Not only is it a tree, you don't need to be euphemistic. It's a forest. And we've got not an army of paparazzi. We've got a blitzkrieg of paparazzi all shooting at us. Gosh. Well, that, that reminds me of the story of the, the supposed car chase through New York, which everybody thought was so funny since it was permanent gridlock at the time. And what's... Well, Sorry. It's a joke because... I went to school in New York, and everybody who has any familiarity with New York at all knows that if traffic goes at five miles an hour, it's going fast. And yet there they were in midtown Manhattan, surrounding Times Square, on a chase at 80 miles an hour for two hours. I mean, you know, they don't even come up with sense to the lines. They come up that, with that was a really crazy story, actually. That story made me wonder, and I tend to be a bit more forgiving, perhaps, than most of Harry and Meghan. That did make me wonder that there were 
they got into a kind of weird, paranoid kind of loop in their heads. And I mean, what's the state of his mental health at the moment? What? what? What's the state of Harry's mental health? Has it been helped by being married to Meghan or has it actually made things more difficult? Sorry, I need to ask the dogs to go and get me co some coke. I feel a head <laughs> cold coming on. Right. But we, 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 assume you, we assume you mean the drink. Assume as you please, my dear. <laughs> uh, I, I, listen, I, I was hoping to provoke you into calling me a naughty boy because you did that last time. <laughs> you are a naughty boy. <laughs> <laughs> you will get this present. <laughs> Very desirable present. Instead of a fee, obviously. You recognised it. They looked like us. I mean, this is fascinating. I mean, but I think public reaction has gone in favour of the, the royal family. I mean, this in some ways has gone so far that, that this must help them. Well, absolutely. But, you know, this has been coming for a while because Harry and Meghan have been so transparently dishonest and so transparently curating works of art that are actually fecal matter. that And people have seen through them. And the more that they go on and on with all of this nonsense is the more people see them for what they are. And they have actually shone a light upon the sterling work and the virtues of the proper royal family. In a funny sort of way, the longer this has gone on, is the more they have been damaging themselves. The, every time something like this happens, they lose supporters. And what they, what they gain is detractors. And do they have staff who advise them, or do they just work their way through them if people don't don't tell them what they want to hear? My understanding is that Megan knows best at all times, and she ignores advice. And Harry, if you don't agree with him, you are not being loyal. So when people don't agree with them, they it, it's the beginning of the end. And also, I understand that from my friends in California, let's put it that way, that both Sunshine Sachs and William Morris Endeavour have had to rip their hair out because it's not possible to get them to stick to a game plan. And you will know, you're in the business, that overexposure is fatal. And that if you have a working plan, you stick to it. You don't decide that you're going to interject all sorts of other narratives. But Megan is a publicity hound, and she has to be covered every day. So no matter what scenario their advisors will come up with, even when they agree with it, they then subvert it and pervert it with their interruptions and their interjections, their wild card antics, you know. I mean, nobody advised them to fabricate a car chase of 80 miles an hour in the middle of Manhattan and to make an announcement of such stupidity. You know, they were good. They hijacked not only Gloria Steinem's award, but they actually hijacked the positive publicity, Gloria Steinem's Miss Award, and that they would have benefited from it. This They are very self-destructive by being know-it-alls. Well, there you go. Actually, it's a very, very sad picture. Um so how, how are things going to play out over the next few days, do you think? I don't like making predictions. But mm. I will say I am quite entertained by how Meghan and Harry must be squirming behind the scenes 
and I'm quite entertained by how Amid Scabies is squirming in front of the sea. And do you see, for example, black community leaders coming forward and saying, you know, we've worked very happily with the king, um, Prince's Trust and all these things. And, and, and so the support comes from actually outside the family, examples of, of the way that he's worked for, for unity across the different um, communities. But they've done it before and they don't need to do it again because they've done it before. And I mean, Trevor Phillips has made the point. Other black leaders have made the point. Uh, you know, the president of Nigeria received the king with equanimity. I mean, it's quite clear that the black community does not believe a word of this. And I think it would be a grave mistake for the royal family every time Harry and Meghan come out with an accusation, whether it is directly or indirectly, that they rebut it. You know, it gives an importance to their accusations that ignoring them actually will actually put it in its proper context. It's more effective. Because, I mean, Phil, you feel that, you know, there is a lot of stuff on social media that this stuff is get, get, gets currency. Well, I, um, I think, I think you know, you're right in Britain that I don't think there are, there's much of a problem, maybe the occasional commentator. But I think in America and in other countries around the world, people will listen to what she's saying. Identity politics is a powerful force. And to be identified as somebody who's racially prejudiced, whether it's fair or not, is a damaging thing, especially if your, one of your jobs, in Kate's case, your future job, is to be the head of a multiracial political organisation. So I think it is a problem going forward. Well, I don't agree because I'll tell you why. First of all, America doesn't count in reality. America isn't part of the Commonwealth. We're not American. And also, Harry and Meghan have been losing supporters in America exponentially. So that's let's rub America out of this equation. Insofar as the Commonwealth is concerned, the damage was done initially, and certainly it was played out when the Waleses were visiting, say, Jamaica and Belize. But more and more people of colour all over the Commonwealth have had the scales fall from their eyes and will continue to. Remember, the average African or Black West Indian reveres and respects family. They only need to look at the way Meghan and Harry treat their family and they will ultimately make the addition that two and two equals four and that Harry and Meghan are behaving treacherously towards their family. You know, by giving Harry and Meghan enough rope to hang themselves with, they've done a pretty good job of it because they have exposed themselves as disloyal, dishonorable, and distasteful. And they are self-promoting, self aggrandizing really jerks well you've been, you've been extremely forthright and, and and very eloquent on that on that and i'm sure anybody listening or watching will know exactly where you stand and uh, and thank you for that i mean it's a it's an incredibly i think it's a big moment actually in the in the story but we'll have to see maybe you'll come back with a get a second mug from us soon well, that would be very nice. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much. For no, thank you so much. For the very short really notice. Appreciate it. Really nice. appreciate it. We'll, we'll talk to you know. soon, and then you have, and, and and we'll celebrate with our mugs. God bless. Get I your want, coat. I want a mug. You, you're <laughs> getting one. Go, go, go and have your coat. God bless. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 